Hello and welcome to Master Fiction Writing with me, Stuart Wakefield, and I have a special guest star today, Emma Desi. Emma, welcome. Hello, Stuart. Thanks so much. It's lovely to be here chatting with you today. I'm so excited. We did actually talk during your bestseller 5.0, Be a Bestseller, and yeah, I thoroughly enjoy talking all things character. So yeah, it's just lovely to have you here with me. For those of you who don't know you, let me do a little, little intro. I'm going to read it because I don't want to get it wrong. Okay, so Emma, Desi, best-selling author and certified book coach, educates and inspires first-time authors to fulfill a calling and write their debut novel. Drawing from her own success and training, the guides writers to finish their first book through detailed feedback, uh, accountability check-ins and compassionate support in a year-long one-to-one membership. Emma lives in Edinburgh, you lucky thing, with her husband, three children, three cats, that's a cat per child, and is passionate about helping authors achieve their dreams through her individualized mentoring. Emma, yeah. I'm very impressed that you individualize your mentoring for different writers. Could you tell me a little bit more about how you do that? Yeah, do you know, I love it. I really like having that time. So I work with my writers for a year at a time. So it's quite a commitment on both sides. And um, so they have to be committed to their book, first of all, and the project. And they have to have trusted me and very feel very strongly that I'm the person to guide them through it. And then, of course, then it's a big commitment for me. I've got to make sure that I'm committed to the, the person I'm working with and getting them through that year. because. It's it's the first book that they're putting together. They're very nervous. There's lots that they do know, but there's lots that they don't know. And so it can be quite a tightrope to balance. So yes, there's um, a level to which I, I work with them on the craft and helping them structure a story, particularly the kind of the big developmental structural side of it. And then we kind of delve into the milestones of each book and what each book requires before we think about the language that's being used and how the chapters are working out but interestingly actually I find one of the big two of the bigger components of that mentorship is first of all accountability a lot of the people I work with have been writing the same book for 10 20 30 years and never finishing it and so having that person who's on them and saying right if you've got your pages ready now we're going to meet up and chat about these it just gives them that accountability so they know they're not writing into a void. They're not writing into a vacuum, but actually somebody, me, is waiting for those pages to come in. And that's a really, really big part of their success, I think, is having that. And then the other big part is um, support element, the brainstorming element, the emotional side of it. And You'll know yourself, Stuart, over 12 months, there's a lot that can happen over those 12 months. Indeed. And, yeah. And I've had one student who came in with to work with me. She said, do you know, Emma, I, I don't, I'm a very self-sufficient person. I don't think I'm going to need that emotional thing, but I appreciate you offering it. And boy, did we delve into that emotional support over the course of yeah. the 12 months because she... She hadn't understood or she hadn't appreciated the or she hadn't noticed let's put it that way she hadn't noticed in herself the ups and downs i think when she hit a lull in her writing she just stopped and so didn't kind of understand that that's actually a big part of it and when you work with a coach or with somebody they help you not put the book down for another year but keep going and support you through it and talk out any of the issues that you're having that they're having to get them through to the end of it so it's a bit, I'm part of someone's life for a long time and it's actually a real privilege. I do really like it. It's, you know, I, obviously I can't work with too many people at one time. So I'm, I'm, I am I'm end up spending a lot of time with them over a month. And, you know, I'm laughing because I, I realise I probably spend more time with them than I do some of my friends who don't live in the same city as me. <laughs> I was going to like that. Yeah, it really, really does. And we're with each other through the ups and downs and, you know, illnesses, bereavements, moving house, all of these things. We're quite often together on that. And so I feel very honoured that I get to be, that they've chosen me to come in and, and do that with them. But the re I deliberately chose a year to do it because, you know, these are women who are writing their first book. So they're still figuring out their process. They're still kind of trying to understand how you piece this long form piece of fiction together and then also it just allows for a bit of life 
to get in the way and to happen and we can have a degree of flexibility with it. So it's not for everybody, is it, you know, working for so long with somebody, but I really, really like it. And I count many of those women that I work with to be my friends now. And it's, it's, it's really lovely. It is interesting how bonding that becomes, because I know you and I, we both come from an acting background. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if you ever experienced this, but, you know, acting is can be very intense. So, you know, sometimes you've got month of rehearsals, sometimes you've got, you know, three weeks and then you're doing a show. It could run two, three weeks, maybe even longer. And at the after show party, it's like you had this special experience and you're kind of bonded. And like, you know, you think you're going to be friends with these people forever. But after the after show party, you never, ever hear from them again. And coaching, I thought, might be like that because it is a very intense relationship. But I am also finding that the people, the writers that I used to work with, you know, we stay in touch. Yeah. Even if they're not writing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, I hadn't, I hadn't put that two together that that likeness together but you're absolutely right it is like putting on a show together and you create this fantastic story together it just happens to be on paper this time some people know they go off and you know they and I don't hear so much from them again only sporadically but then there are others who um we have clicked we have hit it off and we have discovered interests and some commonalities out with writing and so that has kind of helped us cement it all of my clients though live on on the other side of the pond so they're all in america or canada so it does make it harder to kind of see people regularly yes. but um no it is it's lovely and when you've been in an intense situation and i, I wonder if you've discovered this I, i'm sure you have i think a lot of writers think Oh, I'm just writing a piece of fiction. I'm just writing a story. Um, it's not going to be that deep. But actually, it turns out that our first two, three, maybe even four novels are v very autobiographical. So if we're writing a good piece of fiction, if they're writing a good piece of meaningful fiction, we are going to go to some places that the writer hadn't expected to go. And so we do end up talking about things that, they probably haven't told many people or certainly wouldn't have thought they'd be telling me over a Zoom call. Um, yeah. And so it is, I think that then does cement the relationship that little bit further because you're sharing things about yourselves. And I end up doing the same, you know, if a situation in the novel comes up and I, do you know that happened to me once and this is how I felt and this is what happened. And yeah. so we end up sharing bits of our lives together. And um, I wish we did get to have the after show party, though. That would be so nice. It would be awesome. Maybe maybe a book launch. Yes, I'd have to fly over there, but hey, I'm yeah. up for that. <laughs> <laughs> One of my clients got a book deal, but thankfully she's in the UK and the book deal is with a publisher in Wales. So I have more of a chance of actually getting to, to, to a book launch. But yeah, very exciting. That is exciting. You Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm really excited for her. So yeah. you know, she spent two years pitching. She spent eight years, so six, five or six years writing, uh -huh. uh, three years revising, and two years pitching. It's a lot of work, so, isn't it? Yeah. And I said, you should have got a coach when you were writing. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't have taken you six years. But, if only we know. knew if we knew then. But um, I think that just shows, doesn't it, the level of dedication and how passionate we are when we decide we're going to do this, when we decide we're going to write then we're in, we're in 100%. We're going to make it happen one way or the other. Okay. I mean, it really is a marathon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I, I describe it, it's like writing a really, really long essay. <laughs> People's faces drop. But, you know, I do, I do think, do you know, I see so many coaches and editors and, you know, writing coaches build their careers on writing a book is hard. And I don't agree with that. I think writing a book is hard sometimes, mm -hmm. but I think it should be fun. Yes. And I noticed that you have these four pillars of success, of which one is fun. Yeah. So can you tell us about those? those? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, although, I, yeah, remind me to come back. I want to ask you about the, uh, that you don't think it's hard. I'm intrigued. I, I think want it to should more. always be hard. I think it's hard sometimes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, for sure it's hard sometimes. And actually, I do encompass that within within the four pillars. So these four pillars, they originally they sort of came out of my own experiences of writing over the years. And I sort of noticed as I got to know my own process of novel writing, I kind of noticed I had these ups and downs and these different phases of it. And then with my own clients, with my own writers, I noticed over the course of a year, they would go through these phases as well. And then even being on social media, sort of questions that people were asking or the emotions that they were share, sharing in a Facebook group, for example, I realized these are, these are, it's not just me. It's not just the people I work with. These are commonalities. And I'd say that they encompass the person right at the very beginning who's writing their very first a short story or at their first workshop all the way through to people who are at the top of their game um so they i think they they encompass everybody but the first pillar is just the awareness pillar so if we're thinking about sort of newer writers specifically it's that awareness of where you are in the writing and publishing landscape so are you that person who has literally just opened the gate and come through and is looking around and thinking, oh my goodness, I've no idea what's going on here. This is just all so scary and intimidating, but exciting as well. And I can't wait to delve in. Are you that person who has been trying to write a novel on and off for a year, two years? Are you the person who has written that first draft or perhaps you've published your first book or you've been querying authors? Are you in the revision phase? Have you done your first podcast? Have you started running ads? All of these things that encompass a, an author career. And it's just being aware where you are in that landscape because we're all at different places. We're all different experiences. We've all got different desires for it as well of what we want from this this game that we're playing, this fun that we're having. And so just being aware of where you are, almost like sort of lifting your head up from the page and just seeing what's around you and um, noticing that there'll be some people next to you, adjacent to you, but there'll be some people um, ahead of you. And then once you've written that first short story or that second one, you're able to kind of look back and see there's somebody new who's just coming through the gate and you realize, oh, I know a little bit more than I did six months ago, a year ago. So I think just having an awareness of what's going on around you is, is that first pillar. Um, it's not just about the writing itself, but also about the publishing, the marketing and every step along the way. So that would be pillar number one. The second pillar is acceptance. So okay. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm one of those people who's always right. What's next? What's next? What's next? Uh, it's never enough. It's never enough. I'm always jumping the grass is always greener so I'm always trying to jump over the fence to the next place and it's taken me to get to a certain age to realize oh do you know what <laughs> maybe I just need to accept that I'm where I'm at and actually that's okay so if I am the person who um, has written my first short story and I wish I'd written my first novel already I kind of can take a breath and just be okay and accept where I am and I know that I'll get there if I continue to do the work. I'll get to write that first book. I'll get to publish it. I'll get to do my podcast interview. I'll get to do my first blog post. All of those things. So the idea of kind of, you know, stay in the lane that you're in. We Before we started recording, we were mentioning Joanna Penn. And I think she is yes. the one that coined comparisonitis. Yes. So it's taking away that comparisonitis and to not feel I should be doing this. I should have done that by now. Um, and if I give you an example from my own life, I remember when I first started down, because I, I self-published, so when I first started down that route, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I want 30 books published in the next 10 years. I want to build that catalogue. I am nowhere near that. <laughs> <laughs> and I have become aware, I'm just not that type of writer. I can't write rapidly like that. I can't publish rapidly like that. And I look around at some of the other indie authors who have published hundreds of books. I don't know how they do it. I, I do think it's a particular personality type that can do that. And I've had to accept I'm not that personality type. And that's okay. I want to take my time over my books, enjoy writing them. And that's where I'm at. And so I don't know if that resonates with you at all, Stuart, if that's something that you maybe recognize from your own, both our, our acting lives, actually, as well as our writing lives. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think from acting, you know, you kind of get conditioned like 
the next audition, the next job? How's how's all of that going to work? Because especially if you are a full time professional actor, I mean that's putting food on the plate, paying your rent, like all of that kind of stuff. And you know, sometimes you're going to accept jobs <laughs> that maybe you know you probably wouldn't, or you, that's not the kind of like envisioning. But I think there is this, particularly in self publishing, I think there is this pressure to you like constantly being releasing books. And you know, you know, writers come to me and it's like, I'm writing a series, and you know, I'm I'm, I'm part of a way through this, and and you know, this is the overarching thing, and I have to write a book every quarter. And I'm just like, whoa. Okay, like steady on, like especially if this is the first time they're writing, it's like it's going to take a little while, and it may well be that it's going to take you a few years to write that series because you're not necessarily going to be in that cycle of writing a book every quarter. And also, I think there is something around. I do think there are some people who kind of just got it right, but I think there are also people who are like just churning stuff out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. I do think people in certain genres are kind of a bit more forgiving. Mm -hmm. I think if the the hook of the story or the subject of the story is powerful enough, they'll forgive some not great sentences and some terrible grammar and even the odd typo. Uh, but there is this, I think just socially, there is this um, pressure on us to be productive all of the time. And we've moved away from this. Productivity used to be measured, especially when we had kind of like in that manufacturing in, you know, how many units you are producing. OK, now we've moved to this kind of knowledge based working, which is very difficult to okay. quantify. So we've ended up with this looking busy, being busy. And I think some writers fall into that trap that they're being busy, but actually they're not really taking the, the time because it is kind of a knowledge-based kind of working. It's it's learning the craft, it's learning the story, it's learning the characters. There are all of these different things. And I think some people think that their writing should be sitting down, pounding out stuff. Writing can be looking out of the window and thinking about character. Yeah. So sometimes it's write every day. I think is great as a muscle memory and that's fantastic but i wouldn't i don't think people should get caught up in in thinking they have to be pounding out words every day and just coming back to your pillar it's accepting that yeah 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 and being okay and kind of being yeah being okay accepting and being okay with it and as that's so interesting you've made that kind of uh comparison as well and you're so right that we have gone from manufacturing well I, I guess a lot of places britain i can only speak for britain but certainly manufacturing based to this knowledge base and you're so right you can't quantify it in the same way there isn't a unit as such unless you want to class that as a book and i have absolutely been guilty of that and it's i've been thinking about it this week about how i have this big drive to be productive to be productive and if I'm not being productive then am I wasting my time what am I doing I'm and my mum's friend he's a musician okay. and uh, he go he you know he hires out a studio and he goes in and records with people and my question was okay so what are you going to do with that and he, I remember his surprise and he said well do I have to do anything with it I just yeah. like doing it yeah <laughs> This was a complete shock to my entire yeah. kind of way of being. And I had to sit with it and think, I've thought about it quite a lot since he said that to me. And it's sort of seeped into my own, not entirely, I still have to battle with myself not to be trying to jump to the next thing and produce the next thing. Yeah. But I've realized, yeah, what is wrong with doing it simply because you love it and it brings yes. you joy and yeah. Yeah. a sense of well being inside? Yeah. It doesn't have to be something you sell or you produced you know you don't have to make a product out of it so yeah. it's that's been quite fascinating yes and i had a my brain melted so a couple of years ago so i was the municipal liaison for national novel writing month for the county i live in hertfordshire uh -huh. 
And from there, I started the virtual Hertfordshire Writing Group, and we started producing um, anthologies. But one of the guys who was in the group, he had been doing Nano, I think, for 10, 12 years and completed every year and had never gone back to any of those novels. He had no intention of editing, publishing. He just liked doing it. And I could not get my head around that for <laughs> months and months and months. And I, I, I almost felt like I was bullying him. <laughs> And then he started acting like I was bullying him. And then I realized that I just had to had to back off because he had these wonderful, wonderful ideas and titles. And I was like, you need to do something with this. Like, I'll work with you for free. Like, it was like, please do something. No, not interested. Gosh, strength of character there. And he knows what he yeah. wants and what brings him joy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think we put ourselves into so much pressure. So much pressure. We're so unkind to ourselves sometimes. But yeah, I think that kind of acceptance of, you know, you, you probably do this with, with your clients is like, okay, what is your vision? Are you going to seek traditional publishing, self publish, hybrid, something else? And it's really getting to that core of, of what it is that people are trying to do. So, how do you blend that into kind of the acceptance phase? Or the pillar? Well, I, I don't blend it in because it's not my book and it's not my sort of. Um, do you mean for myself or for my clients? Or? For your clients. So when you're working in that kind of acceptance pillar, mm -hmm. is if if somebody is going to go for self-publishing or traditional publishing, is there a difference to the way that you that might mentor them over your year? No, do you know, there's not, okay. not in terms of how I mentor them, um, but it's, it's the question is just great for them to know what it is that they want, what they're working towards. And it does change. I've noticed it changes over time. So some people will, some people will come in, especially younger people will come in and say, I want to self-publish. I know that that's what I want. But older people will come in and say, I want to traditionally publish. And that's fine. So we know what we're going for. We have an expectation there. Okay, well, how long the book needs to be? We need to be thinking about making sure we hit all those right milestones and um, that it's something that we think a publisher will go for or an agent will go for. But it is interesting how over the course of a year, a lot of people will change their mind about the route that they want to take. And I don't think it's because I don't think it's because they're trying to take the easy route. But I think, so the, the women that I work with predominantly, I'd say they're 65 and up. And okay. they've been writing this book for a lot for, as I say, sometimes up to 30 years. So this is a mm. big, big part of their life. Yeah. And I think there is an element of them that realizes to get this in. So my promise to my client is we will finish that first draft. You'll have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, so then they, there is still a, a point of revision that they need to do and they and they understand that this is going to take time. And so I think uh, their their sort of concept of time and their awareness of where they are in their life, the slowness of traditional publishing and all the and how difficult it can be makes them kind of re reconsider. Well, what is it that's most important? Is it most important that I have? you know, Random House or Penguin on the side of the book? Yeah. Or is it important that actually I just get this book out in the world and I've, and I've achieved this thing and I get to share it with either the people I love or, you know, if a stranger buys it, that's fantastic. But I think their acceptance of where they are in life and their what they want for that book changes as well. Yeah. And I know it certainly did for me as I was kind of thinking about what do I want long term? So I think there's a level of acceptance there that maybe the dreams that they, the idea of success that they perhaps had in their 20s is very different to what they have in their 60s. And that's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, so pillar one is awareness. Pillar two is acceptance. And pillar three is the really, the one that we sit in for the longest, I would say. And that's the growth pillar. Okay. And the growth if we're, we're thinking about the actual writing itself that's the that's the hard grind of being a writer 
That's yeah. the getting your bum in the seat, even when the muse is not with you that day. That is the work of being a fiction writer or indeed a nonfiction writer, but that's where the work comes in. And you have to put that work in. We mentioned muscle memory earlier on. You don't have to write every day, but it does help even if it's a small amount because it does help your brain just to kind of stretch, strengthen that writing muscle. So it, it does get easier and easier the more that you do because yeah. it feels less intimidating. If you write every day, even a little bit, it keeps you in touch with your story. So you don't have to keep reminding yourself of what this book is about and who the characters mm. are and what they just did. So that makes it feel easier and easier as well. But there's no doubt about it. As you were saying earlier, there are difficult times to this. That's a real roller coaster of an emotional journey, yeah. not just the hard work of sitting down, but also sometimes the subject matter that we're writing about, especially if it's close to our own lives or the lives mm. of somebody we know, that is can be hard and that can make us want to step back from the book because we're a bit scared of what we might discover once we we start writing. But that is where the growth comes and the the harder it, it is, the bigger the growth, the stronger the growth. And one of my things that I say a lot is that writing a book is not just about the words on the page. It's about who you become in the process. Yes. And even if you write one first draft and never do anything more with it, you're still going to be a different person by the end of it. You have grown. You've achieved something that's difficult, that's hard, mm -hmm. time consuming, that's a long, long term project. As Jenny likes to say, it's an intellectual endeavor, and it certainly is. Even just the project management side of it can be that intellectual endeavor. But you've also learned something about yourself as you've written this book. And so I feel, anyway, in every conceivable way, you have grown in some way. And, and that is the growth pillar in which we sit for the longest time. Yeah. It does change you. It does change you. And just for those who don't know, Jenny, like, you know, Jenny Nash is the founder and CEO of Author Accelerator. And uh, both myself and Emma went through the training, hundreds of hours of training, three lots of practicums, including written work, video calls, all of that to become certified for coaches. And Jenny wrote a book called a Blueprint for a Book, which forms like part of the kind of foundation of the, of the training that Emma and I have done. So. I find it really interesting that you say about how different we come out the other end. And I know acting jobs, we get to that point when we're, we're doing them and you think you're about halfway through rehearsals and you're like, why am I doing this? Like, <laughs> you know, like, why do I even do this job? It's so emotionally draining sometimes. And the same thing I've noticed happens with, with my writing, with my clients' writing. You get to that point where it's like, Sometimes this is torture. Like, why am I doing this to myself? But then when somebody gets to the end of a draft or the end of the final draft, they are changed people. So can you give us an example of maybe a client you've worked with and the growth that you've seen through them as a person as they've gone through the mentoring with you? Mm, yes, I can think of one lady, Janice in particular. She had been writing her book, I'd say, for 20 years. She had three different sort of unfinished versions of it. She kept changing her mind. And at the beginning, she didn't really know what the story was about. She didn't really know what she was trying to say with the story, but she knew it was something to do with her own professional experiences as a a woman in the field of science and, and all the kind of baggage that came with that back in the 70s and 80s. But by the end of it, not only did she get a clearer kind of, she was able to sort of look back with more clarity on that time and how it related to the story that she was trying to tell, which is one thing. But then uh, the second thing was that she, she was able to kind of complete this project and the scientist in her, you know, loved the idea of completion and knowing that she had got to the end and she understood what that story was about. But the third thing I would say is that, and she said this herself, she was quite emotional when she was saying, you know, I, I, I can hold my hand up with honesty and say I am a writer now. She stepped into that identity of being a writer, which I think a lot of newer writers or more inexperienced writers don't yet feel. And it's not until you've put that growth in, you've put that hard work in and that grind in and you come to the end and you realize, wow, I've earned my stripes here. 
this is something I've wanted for so, so long and I've achieved it and I have learned my craft and, and I can see, I think it is that word identity. It, yes. It's feeling it in your body, not just words on a page. You feel like the writer you've always wanted to be. Of course, like all, like all creative endeavors, all artists, you never know it all. You continue learning. Yeah. But she's going to step into that learning with a whole new confidence that she never had before. She's not going to be doubting herself in the same way anymore. She's mm-hmm. now got the evidence that she needs to know that she can do it. And she started on her next book. So that, I think, is um, one nice example of one person in particular who has had that whole character arc from beginning to end. Yeah. yeah. But I'd say, too, as well, and I- I've noticed this with almost everybody, when we start working together, they come on from the call and a bit nervous and yes. oh, what am I going to say about my pages and is she going to like them? Please let her like them and say nice things. And then let's say it's very much a, a teacher student relationship, I would say at that time. Right. And I notice that about six or seven months in, there's a sudden shift in the dynamics of the call. Yes, I'm still feeding back on the pages. I'm still asking questions, that good old why question. Why are they doing this? Why are they saying this? But my clients come into the call much more as a peer. They're no longer feeling quite the inexperienced student that they once were. They're now coming with ideas. They're coming with questions to ask, what do you think about this? Do you think that motivation feels right? Do you think that they would do this? Or if I quiz them on something, they've got the answer. They've thought about it already. Or um, if I say, if I've got a comment that's like, you know, put it on the page or it's not on the page. And they're like, oh, I knew you were going to say that. I knew I hadn't done it. So they're catching themselves with the, you know, not mistakes, but they're catching where they need to improve in the next round of revisions. So there's a real shift in dynamics and they might not notice it and they might not be able to articulate that. But I see that change. And it's lovely because now I feel like we're coming on this call to have this lovely discussion about this book and it's peer to peer, colleague to colleague, writer to writer, a little bit less of the the student to to teacher. So it's, I see it with every person I work with, they shift, they change. Yeah. And and I think there is that element of like teaching or coaching that they learn through the questions that you are asking to ask those questions themselves when they're writing yeah and and i'm sure this has happened to you but i've definitely had clients say it's like there's a little steward sitting on my shoulder going yeah but why but and i and i I do say and i probably shouldn't do this is from a business point of view it's terrible but i say to people if i do my job properly you don't ever need me again because when you go into your second novel you will be asking why and asking all those those questions for yourself. And you're right, there is that shift. There is that shift and there's this sudden kind of acceleration that that you see and you see that growth. And it's not just about getting getting things on the page, although that is a huge part of it. So many writers don't get the emotion on the page or backstory or really understand how to do it but also to really understand and think about story objectively, Mm -hmm. whether it be other people's stories, but most importantly, their own. And that paradigm shift in their attitude to to story is, I mean, it's just thrilling to see. Yeah, it is thrilling. Yeah, it is. And I think it's lovely as well when People listening might not feel this way, but I think it is a positive thing when a writer stops seeing their book as their baby and actually kind of see this as being that little bit more objective and it's something that they want to shape and they want it to be something that other people can read and it's something that they want to share with the world and can be much more objective about it, see its flaws. You know, I've got three kids. I love them to bits, but I can see the flaws and I'm working towards improving them. And I think that is the same with our yeah. books as well. We want to be proud of them and to love them, but we, we want to have that objective third eye to think, OK, what's going to make this even better and have it much more success when it leaves the nest where it leaves home. And you're right, they will take that into the second book. But I probably, um, I think I would disagree with you slightly in that I think we, I have a coach and I think it's important that we do work with somebody. It might, 
the length of time perhaps might be different and the nature of the relationship might be different. But I think always having that outside input, it can only elevate what's possibly already a good manuscript. But if someone comes to you and says, can we spend three months on this, just refining it and getting it great? It's only going to be for the good. Even if they've worked with you before or they've worked with another coach before, they're always you're always going to help them elevate the skill level they've already got so that with every book they get better and better and better yeah yeah and i and i think you're right and i think this is why i said it's probably a really stupid business decision to even utter that because i'm working with a coach on on my book and i was certified what, two and a half years ago you know i wrote my first book in 2009 and... you've been out there a wee while yeah, but it, I mean, it was a complete disaster. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a coach or an editor or anything like that. And it was purely by chance that something happened that I won't go into, but it sold thousands and thousands of copies, right? Wow. And it just took off. But no book since then has done that. And I think people <laughs> read it. I'm just like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. So they didn't read the sequel. and. You know, it's I kind of finding a new audience through kind of my later, most recent kind of fiction. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, I, if I say to somebody, if somebody says to me, I'm going to read you like one of your books, the first thing I say is like, don't read the first one. Don't read the first one. And I, I myself published and took it out of publication. And one of my clients, bless her, every time she finds a paperback version she buys it and sends it to me because she's trying to get them out of circulation <laughs> oh bless is that because she's read it <laughs> yes. thank you but yes probably probably but yeah it was it was a kind of a very niche genre and i would never ever write anything like that's that it, that's a that's a growth pillar isn't it that's that yeah thinking about that that's you've learned i mean kudos to you i think you did the right thing you jumped in there 2009 when everything was just starting and you embraced this new technology too many people like myself were very snobby about it live to regret it uh, but you know i think all, cu all credit to you for kind of embracing that and giving it a go and and learning as you went along and, and it is vulnerable even now even with getting coaching, getting editing, and all the services we have available to us now, which we didn't have back in 2009, yeah. it's still a vulnerable thing to do to put something you've poured your heart and soul into out mm. on the open market for anybody to read and comment on. Yes. Um, it's hugely vulnerable. So that in itself is another bit of growth that we all have to go through. We all have to get that first one-star review. Yeah, I, I wear mine with a badge of honor because it what it told me was not just my friends and family who are reading my book now it's getting a wider audience so that is a mm. good good thing and so that was a little bit of growth for me but you must tell me the story of how it went viral another time <laughs> okay okay but, but yeah i mean uh, what you said about so I, I do a lot of work with my clients about emotional resilience mm. i even wrote like a very short ebook about it so how do you handle that emotional resilience piece during during growth so for myself i will go and kind of talk to my author friends or talk to my coach about it with my clients a lot of it is listening a lot of it is reassuring them that this is a part of it that this is the up and down of it and in fact i have a call later today with a client who has reached a point of she's nearing the end of okay. the book and yeah. now she's having that fear that almost like that fear of success fear of completion that she doesn't want to put the book out in the world because she loves it too much and I think she's scared of what what might might happen if she does and I think that is a completely natural response for some people some people have that fear of starting some people have that fear of completion and will self-sabotage so that they don't need to go to that next step and don't need to move on to it we get to kind of talk about that and that this is kind of where the coaching comes in and understanding well what's underneath that is it because you don't feel the book itself is good enough that it just needs more work or is it an emotional thing that's going on and the fear of well, what's the next step um as I, I can't remember if i've said but I, I work with women and it's women who are older who 
for many, technology is a genuine kind of barrier. And the idea of marketing is a genuine barrier and it puts a lot of fear into them. So it could be something like that, you know, that that is what is stopping somebody. And I know it does for some because they've told me that that is what stops them from kind of getting past that halfway mark and getting to the end. So a lot of it is digging down and finding out, okay, well, what's underneath that emotional fear that you're going through? Is it something real? Is it something imagined? And one of my favorite things to do for myself is to go, well, what's the worst that could happen? And go down that kind of line of questioning. So what is the worst that could happen if I finish the book? Okay, what's the worst that could happen if I revise the book? What's the worst that would happen if I publish it? What's the worst that would happen if I get a one-star review? Or what's the worst that could happen if an agent rejects me? And if we verbalize out loud what's the worst thing that we could imagine happening, invariably we realize that is not going to happen. You know, our imagination, we always imagine much worse than is actually ever going to happen in real life. Or we imagine things that people are saying things about us that they would never say or think things about us that they would never think. And so once we kind of lift the veil from that and we can take a sigh of relief and at least we feel we know what we know the enemy we're facing and we can go in prepared. Hmm. So that's often usually um, no matter what stage we're in along that growth and no, no matter if it's to do with writing, publishing, marketing, it's one of our levels. It's one of our imposter syndrome. Uh, symptoms coming out and showing itself and if we can understand which imposter syndrome symptom is is showing itself we can work through that and then move on from there until the next time it rears its ugly head what kind of responses do you get when you say what's the worst that would happen if you got a one-star review often it's the same thing it's well they'll say no someone will say no um, or that people won't like it. And there's often a fear, too, that, um, you know, if, if it's someone's a, very much an introvert, that fear of having to go and talk about your book yeah. uh, and the fear of kind of selling your book or what they perceive as selling their book rather than just telling people about their book, um, that can be a big fear as well. But um, genuinely as well to the technology, so we can break that down. You know, if you don't want to do podcasts, don't do them. That's okay. You know, if you'd prefer the medium of words, Lots of people are still doing blogs, so you can still do it that way. If it is about the writing itself or the fear of completion, then it will be, well, what if an agent says no? What if I do get that one-star review? What if nothing ever happens with it? I think sometimes as well, there's a kind of, especially if if there's a partner in the background, there can be, you know, I've invested so much money in this and what if it doesn't pay off? I'll feel guilty about not earning it back and not having a big bestseller and all of that. So there's lots of things that are going on. Um, And then if it is that kind of interfere, we can go back to that question that you were asking earlier, which was around success and what does that mean and what do you want for the book? And, and in fact, one of the questions I do ask when I'm um, talking to somebody, because before we start working together is, well, what happens if, or how would you feel if, this is not the book that you publish, that you get to the end of it and you realize, I don't want to publish this. I don't think it's good enough. It's not the book I thought it was going to be. How would you feel about that? And most people at the time will say, okay, I'd be okay, but and um, I would just move on to book two. It's quite a different thing, I think, though, when you do come to the end and you have put in that hard work. It raises up a lot of emotions. And sometimes it's just having someone holding your hand and saying, this is a good book. Yes. You know, stand by it, stand behind it. This is a really good book. And you can do this. And that can give them the confidence and the courage they need, that we all need, that resilience to move on to that next step. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, my, my client who just got the book deal, did I mention they just got a book deal? I'm sure <laughs> I did. I'm going to be lunching out of this for years. Um, but that's a, that's a really good point, though, Stuart. And I hope for our listeners to kind of hear that, that our client's success is our success. We yes. are with them 100%. We are so behind them. We are almost as invested in the book as they are. We're certainly more invested in it than anybody else outside of them is. Yes. Their friends yes. and their family support them, love them. They're not as invested in this book as we are. We care about their success and their success is our success. Yes. And, you know, she'd been pitching for two years 
and you know she had a couple of breakdowns you know but i knew that manuscript was good and i knew i you know so much of it is about luck and timing unfortunately but she kept going and she actually submitted to a publisher in the end not an agent mm. and she ended up in front of a panel i think it was like welsh a welsh arts council panel and she wasn't expecting that so they kind of you know she was blindsided but on the panel was a, a guy from waterstones a buyer and he said it was one of the two most saleable manuscripts he'd ever read wow and I felt so vindicated because I knew that manuscript was good. Wow. And through all of the rejections, you know, that she'd been getting from agents, that, you know, it was really starting to erode, you know, her confidence. And again, like you say, like I've wasted all of this time. I've wasted all of these years writing this story and it's not good enough. And lo and behold, you know, big group of people, professionals, say this is absolutely brilliant. Yeah, they asked for a couple of revisions, nothing major. And, you know, she turned them back in and, you know, the ink is drying. Yeah. So, yeah. And again, that's about emotional resilience as well. It's, it's not only getting through writing the novel, but it's also how emotionally resilient are you to go through the pitching process as well because like us with auditions there's lots of rejections yeah yeah and it's how do you pick yourself up and how do you keep pitching yeah yeah and that is something i do talk to my, um, my clients about who are wanting to go that traditional route and i, I do sort of paint a, a worst scenario for them because i want them to understand that this is hard that it might take a hundred people to get the right agent you might get a top publisher but they're going to ask for revisions so your work on this book might not be done when you think it's done and it's up to the author to have that self-belief in their book to say okay I can work with those changes you want Mr Publisher or to say no actually I think this book is as good as it is or I'm not willing to make that particular change you want but I will make these and if the publisher says no can do, then that's a big kind of moment to say, yeah. OK, but I'm going to stand by my vision for this book. And it reminds me of Dolly Parton. Bit of a segue there. Fabulous. <laughs> I'm quite happy with the Dolly segue. I love <laughs> I'm going to drink Dolly. my tea while you say this. Dolly is, um, I just think she's an amazing woman in, in so many ways. But I remember a story she told about her song, I Will Always Love You. Of course, the Whitney Houston big hit. So she ha obviously had that hit, first of all, back in the 60s, I think it was. Elvis Presley wanted to buy that song from her and would have paid a, uh, a good penny for it. But he wanted to buy it. So he wanted the rights to it. He didn't want to lease it. And she said, you know, she said no to him. And when she talks about it now, and she said, you know, I said no. And she said, but don't think that was an easy decision because that was Elvis Presley. He was the biggest star in the world at that time. She said there were sleepless nights. There was lots of tears. I really wrangled with myself, but I had to hold myself to the vision of this is my song. Um, I love this song. It came from my heart. It was about her former partner, music partner. And um, so she held on to it. So that's like one of us saying no to Penguin or saying no to Hachette or someone but we need to be strong in our belief of our book and our vision for our book and decide for ourselves where that line can be crossed or can't be crossed and it can be worth it because we can see that Dolly held on to that it became a huge hit for Whitney Houston she's done she's been able to add a little bit more to Dollywood with the proceeds and that's the same for us if we hold on to it we wait for that that publisher who is in alignment with what we are trying to do it might not get as big a a burst on the, in terms of marketing and things, but having a publisher who's behind you and loves your work and what you do and absolutely believes in you, that's worth more, I would say, than the the short term goal of a good advance. So yeah, yeah, and I, and I think part of our role is you know we have a trained professional judgment, and you know our belief in a manuscript can really help the writer have the belief in the manuscript 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they get to that point where an agent might say, I need you to make these changes so I can sell this to a publisher, then the publisher says, I need you to make changes so I can sell this to the public. If those visions aren't aligned, the writer is well within their rights to say, thank you, but no, thank you. Yeah. And, and that's not it doesn't easy, mean is it? it's dead in the water. There are other agents and there are other publishers. And it's really important to find people that, that share that vision. And I'm working with a, a client at the moment. He'd, he'd, he'd written the first draft of a story, started to kind of like punt it around a bit. and the lead character is a is a, a boy and the agents were coming back and saying well it really needs to be a girl but it fundamentally changes the story mm -hmm. and he ended up hiring me because he wanted a guy his age <laughs> and i took one look at it and i was like there is no way this story could be with a female lead and he's like, finally, like, you know, and it was just like, but his instincts were absolutely right. It would fundamentally unravel everything that he was trying to achieve if the lead character was a girl. And, you know, I, I again, luck and timing, you know, we don't know yet. He's coming to his last, you know, 40, 60 pages. And, you know, we'll, then we'll have like the view of the, the whole thing. But, you know, he's going to take it out there and I'm going to be interested to see how the landscape has changed in the sort of 18 months, year that we've been been working together or when, like, since he last was touting it around. So, again, as coaches, you know, I think our professional judgment carries a lot of weight, or at least it should do, and really help that, that writer, you know, go out into the world. And you've done that through the acceptance phase as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah accepting that the landscape does change or the publication landscape does change. And as you're saying, what was working, what was not working 18 months ago might work now. And I see that in my own life as well, my own writing. You know, I write very dark stories and I published my first one. I think it was just before 2019. So a couple of years okay. before coming up to COVID, nobody wants dark stories at that time it was just kind of not what people wanted they wanted rom-com they wanted light things or they wanted something that was about a virus so not a fit at all but now that's changed and um people are more interested in dark stories again and i'm seeing that reflected in 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 my own results there with my own sales and things so it does be strong in your book and yeah. kind of be aware and accepting that you, the type of story you're writing might not be in the zeitgeist right now, but it will come around at some stage. And I certainly think this about the acting profession. It's not about how good the book is. It's not about how good your acting is. A lot of it is luck and talking to the right person, but a lot of it is catching the zeitgeist and what's in. And I, I learned that quite early on when I spoke to one of the agents at Madeleine Milburn. Okay. which is a big agent here in the UK. It was just, it was the most informative conversation I'd had with an agent. And I understood so much more about the business of publishing and what people were looking for. And that was the moment I decided I'm not going to pursue traditional because it reminded me too much of the casting room. And yeah. you're going to be right. Is your face going to fit? Do you match the other books that we've got here? Um, and I realized, you know, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. if I'm going to fail, I want to fail on my own merit. If I'm going to succeed, I'll do it on my own as well. So that guy at Madeleine Milburn, he gave me an awareness of the the publishing landscape and the kind of how agents work and what they're looking for. Mm. And then that was, I had to accept that, that yeah. that was the way it yeah. worked. And I could either continue to pursue traditional knowing that and hope that I fit with the zeitgeist or do what I did which was choose the the independent route mm -hmm. um which I'm very glad I did I do think it's a lovely space to be in yes. but um I've lost my train of thought but things come around yeah things come around mm -hmm. and go around and that awareness that things change and being accepting of where where you sit right now doesn't mean it's not going to change in the future I think it was Kristen Hanna Firefly Lane she published that book mm -hmm. 20, 25 years ago, and it kind of sat mid-list for a long, long time. And then all of a sudden, TV series, 
Yeah. It's bestseller. Yeah. So everything comes around. Um, don't yeah. give up on your book. Just hold firm. Even with if it. you look at, you know, War Horse. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that had been around for ages. And then suddenly the National Theatre put it on. Amazing production. Yeah. And then the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So the I think that's shown us that books have a shelf life beyond launch day. Yes. Yes. And it's all discoverable as well, eventually. And shout out, to, I can't remember the author's name, but whoever wrote Kissing the Coronavirus. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's terrible and it's trashy, but it's not very long. And I was just really like, you know. And then the follow-ups were the one about the, you know, when COVID like mutated. Oh, yes. I didn't that, that, read the second one. Yeah, that, that was the follow-up. And then there was one about the um, the inoculation. Oh, really? <laughs> just like, why didn't I think of that? That's so <laughs> good. <laughs> so they, yeah. that author caught the zeitgeist and just wrote yeah. something funny and it took off. Yeah, yeah timing. Yeah. Absolute timing, timing. But I think so, that's a nice way to kind of segue into that final pillar, which is the yes. fun pillar. Yes, please. Uh, and I think that author was having fun when they yes. wrote that short story, for sure. So I don't know about you, but I certainly started writing as an escape. It was something to do in my free time. It was something I loved. It switched me off from the day-to-day -day trauma that I was going through at the time. But when I decided that I wanted to write this book with a view to publishing, suddenly I became very earnest. Yeah. and deadly serious about it and all the kind of fun that I had with it and the reason I turned to it in the first place disappeared yeah. and I don't think I'm alone I know I'm not alone that lots of us do as soon as we decide we love this we want this to be our job or a second career or an additional career we get very very serious about it and we buy all the books and we buy all the courses and do all the webinars but we lose that joy that we had when we first started doing it and so I want people to really try and, and reclaim some of that fun. And that might be a small thing that you've, you've figured out a little plot and hole in your book and you've figured out how you're going to make that work. Yes, ka-ching, extra bar of chocolate for me to celebrate today. Yeah. It might be getting to the end of that first draft. Cool, I'm going to go to the cinema and celebrate. It doesn't matter what it is and it doesn't have to be big. It just has to be a little moment of acknowledgement that you take for yourself to know I've grown <laughs> yeah. a little bit of growth here as I've figured this bit out. And now I'm going to celebrate that and have a little bit of fun to acknowledge it. And I think that that's important to, we get to kind of see when we do that, we get to see how far we've come. We, we look at the, the awareness of how far we've come along that path. And it buoys us up and it motivates us and it rejuvenates us and makes us feel excited again for that next little bit of our hard work that we're about to embark on. And then, of course, when we publish the book, you know, we either have the book launch or we go out for dinner or we do something lovely with it. You know, the same if you do your first podcast or you set up your first ad or you get your first rejection. That is something to celebrate as well, because you've reached that point. You've reached that point where you can send your book out, that you're proud enough of your book that you're, you're going to send it out to be rejected or accepted. All of these little milestones, they all need just a moment of acknowledgement of how far you've come along this pathway so that you feel rejuvenated to continue and not being burnt out, but to continue along it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I said before, you know, I, it, it does annoy me when people build their businesses on telling writers that writing a book is hard because it makes it sound like it's always hard okay yeah and it and it doesn't but and i have the same this is a bit random but it irritates me when people say i want to be in a serious relationship i'm like i don't want to be in a serious relationship i want to have fun and laugh and you know be silly together and i know that's not what they mean i know they mean like commitment but I think there is that difference and it's like writing okay you're in a serious serious you're in a committed relationship mm -hmm. where you're going to have fun right and i think of this about the difference between writing and story like the craft you need to be serious and committed to the craft but the story is the bit where you play and you have fun and yeah there are plot holes but you know you can be losing at monopoly and still having fun 
Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And then, you know, you get you get some cards or a good dice roll and great, you're suddenly you're back in the game. And it's still fun. The experience should be more often than not fun. That's such a great analogy. Yeah, you can lose at Monopoly and still have a good time. And for sure, I think that is exactly like novel writing, that you do have those moments where it's tough and you can't figure it out. And so you have a coach mm-hmm. that you can turn to and say, yeah. can't figure this out. But equally, when you get in the groove, when you get in the vibe and you get in the flow and you're in a section of the book that you're really enjoying, well, there's nothing like it. It's yeah. just the best high. And for us, you know, as creatives, some people need to go for a jog. They need to go for a run. They need to go to the gym. And that's how they balance out their brain and they keep the chemicals even. For us as creatives, we need to write. That is one of the yes. ways that we balance our brains and keep ourselves sane. And so when we do that, we're having fun. And we, although you might have that kind of trepidation about sitting down, first of all, first getting into it, you know yourself from experience. Once you get into it, it's then hard to come away from it because you're having so much fun with it and enjoying it. And, you know, for some people, they know the first drafting phase, they know their process and the first drafting they don't love so much, but they Mm. know that they're going to enjoy doing those revisions. They might not enjoy the third revision quite so much, but they know by the time (laughs) they get to the fourth revision, they're back on a roll and they're loving it again. And so this is part and parcel of it. So I I see what you're saying then about how um, it's not always hard there certainly are hard elements to it. Um, so I, have, I remember saying to somebody, you know, writing a book's not complicated. You're just telling a story. You know, it's not complicated. They were horrified that I'd said this. But the thing is, even though it's not complicated, it's not easy either. And there are, um, it, it's, it's, um, it's a challenge to make it simple, to simplify and, and not yes. get too, and not make it too complicated. I think yes. a lot of newer authors want to have so much going on, but just the simpler you can make it, the more enjoyable mm. a ride it's going to be for your, for your reader. But um, you know, I get what you're saying when you say that, that it's not always hard, but we need that hard bit. Otherwise we wouldn't enjoy the good bit. So we need yeah, that growth. Uh, yeah. And I don't, and also I think with, with, do the difficult moments, whether they be getting the words on the page or getting the story kind of straightened out in our heads and on the page, there wouldn't be that sense of accomplishment at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You no, know, if 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 you were just trolling off a book, you know, and you didn't feel an achievement at the end, I would argue that you weren't really thinking about what you were writing. And it possibly wouldn't get professional eyes on it, mm-hmm. you know, and because bored. yeah. How dull yeah. is that to just kind of go through the motions of it? That's not why we write. Yeah, and just pound them out, you know. And you know, I don't think it was interesting what you said about writing kind of being a bit of a refuge. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Um, a lot of the romance writers that I've worked with and I know aren't in very happy marriages. It's really interesting. Yeah. And, and I do have to kind of like steer them away from kind of the Mary Sue kind of way of writing. But it is interesting that there is this escapism and a lot of readers, or I shouldn't generalize, some of the readers I've met as well aren't in particularly happy relationships and it's that bit of escapism it's that all things have just dried up not literally but uh you know it's just having that little spark because that and you get that in writing as well when you have that breakthrough you get that little spark and it is a kick and it is you know the endorphins flow yeah so again yeah fun you know yeah I think that's why I probably write on the darker side. My life generally is pretty good, and uh, I can, so I can I can aff- I can emotionally <laughs> afford to go to that dark yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I just I don't feel that. I know my husband's always like, "Oh, look, it's another true crime show that's come up on the continue watching feed. What a surprise!" <laughs> but yeah, I kind of I love those things. But we do, isn't it? It's why we read, why we write. Um, is to go and live vicariously through 
for somebody else to experience a more exciting life, whether that be a danger excitement or a love excitement. And we want to kind of go and live that through them and then feel, come back to our own lives and kind of feel comforted that, whew, I don't have to go through that. Yeah. 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 I wrote romance. So I need to go back and just check my relationship is okay. <laughs> But it's natural, isn't it? If you have been married for 20, 30, 40 years, it's, you know, it's the cycles of um, of a marriage as well. We go through these. And um, I mean, I certainly have been through phases in my life when I've read romance and then phases where I've not. And I think that's probably the same for a lot of other people. It's what you're looking for at that time. And it, I've got a friend who um, she's a lawyer she was used to be a lawyer with the un she did a lot of work with them and now she still does kind of uh, justice work in hong kong super super smart woman uses her brain all day long and she's like i just want to read jackie collins at the end of the day i don't want to have to be thinking about the story it's my time to switch off it's my time for the ridiculous for the sublime you know not have to think about it and if we are if we are living in stressful lives where we're overstretched and there's too much stimulus and too many worries going on, how lovely to go off into this um, romantic world or this world of danger that ha doesn't have anything to do with our own lives but just takes us out of that. Um, I'm not a big romance reader, but I was recommended Book Lovers by Emily Henry. Okay, yeah, and lovely. Loved it. Absolutely yes. loved it. Just fill that space that I needed right there. Beautifully written, tongue in cheek, had all the tropes that you need for a nice, lovely romance and a happy ending. Yes. You couldn't want more. And so I think every book has that potential to give us that little bit of escapism that we need, whether we're writing it or reading it. Yeah. Yeah. I quite agree. Quite agree. And how wonderful for us to help people get there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, Emma, it's been a pleasure. Where can people find you online? Well, the easiest thing to do is go to my website, emmadesi.com. If you put my name in Google, you will find me. It's a very unusual name. Um, and But you'll find my website and you'll see there how I can help debut writers write that first, first novel, either through that 12-month mentorship. Um, but the other way that I do help writers is um, if you've written a, a manuscript and you're looking for a big overview review of it i do a manuscript review as well and that uh, you'll find all the details there on my website fabulous thank you so much listen i could have talked for another hour so mm -hmm. chances are i'm going to have you back if you're okay yo i'd that. love that yes please all right brilliant but for now thank you very much thank you all right take care bye bye